Amen. One verse, Psalms 23. Hallelujah. Sometimes we hear scriptures that over and over and over again, but sometimes when we start to take a separate look at it, we start to learn different things. Psalm 23 and verse 2. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, and he leadeth me beside the still waters. Father God, I thank you, Lord. I thank you that you are Jehovah Shalom, our peace. I thank you, Father God, that peace is something that you are and a peace is something that you give us, Lord God. And I thank you, Father God, that we can fully commit anything that we are going through, Father, into your hands and know that you are able to keep it, you are able to save it, you are able to fix it, Father, because nothing is too hard for you, God. Lord, we just come to you tonight, and I just thank you for your faithfulness, Lord God. Lord, that you prove yourself over and over and over again to be a father that we can depend on, a father who is faithful, Lord God, that you are a present help in the time of trouble. Lord, I just ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see what the Spirit is saying tonight, Lord. Father, help us, Lord God, to understand how to be still in you and how to rest in you and how to trust in you so that we would truly know that you are our Father, that, Lord, that you want to bear the burden, Lord God, that we are bearing, Father God, that we're not supposed to bear it, but we're supposed to cast our cares upon you and live and find that, that rest that we need in you, Father. So, Lord, let your word go forth like seed and let it not return unto you void, but, Father, let it accomplish that for which you have sent it. Father, help us to find peace, Lord God, in our storm. Help us, Lord God, to put you at the center of the storm. Put our, our lives and everything that pertaineth to us into your hands, Father God. And we just praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to talk to you tonight as we are in um, this series uh, called Finding Rest. How many need rest? How many really understand what rest really is? Um, rest is, is more than a vacation. Rest is more than um, escaping and going shopping or whatever you do for quiet time. Rest is really, truly um, to, to find ultimate and total peace. Okay? Rest is not to escape Sometimes we, we are going through things and we need to, you know, just kind of get away from it and pull ourselves back and when we escape from our problems. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, my peace, I leave you. My peace, I give you. And, and not a peace that the world knows, but his peace. And his peace is something different. And we've come from uh, learning about the orphan spirit and, and understanding that the orphan spirit is a spirit that basically is is a, is it's it's all about self performance and and works and all of that and trying to um, cover yourself and trying to do stuff for yourself that God says you can't do that for yourself. I need to do that for you. You need to understand that I am your father and I want to take care of your burdens. I literally want to lift off the load that you're carrying. You know how many in this place tonight are carrying. A burden and it, it really is it is it is it is getting very heavy and it's to a point that you really can't carry it anymore you're carrying something that God has not intended you to carry and I want to tell you that until you surrender that and put it in the Lord's hands you're going to continue carrying it, and you're not going to have that peace. And I know that that's very frustrating because you're saying, well, what does that mean? Do I just do nothing? And our minds can't wrap around what doing nothing and what trusting God really means, okay? So um, I want to talk, you know, we talk about rest, and 
why is rest so important? And you need to understand that God is the author and finisher of our faith. God is the manufacturer of our bodies. And when God designed our bodies, he designed our bodies that we have to fuel our bodies with food. And he also, dev- he also de- uh, designed our body that we have rest. And I studied this, and it's and I just this, this will be a little bit teachy for you, but we need to understand why it is important to rest. Because um, you know there were many times when I had different surgeries and everything, and especially after my my three children, that I all had C sections, and I had them on Monday, and I was back in church on Friday. And I was doing the work and, you know, I was in ministry and I was, yes, I know people looking at me like, are you kidding me? And I was like, yes, I had my child in the car seat on the pulpit. I had staples. Vinny is here. He's a testimony to it. He saw it. He knows. Um, Some people think, wow, that's awesome. Some people think you're insane. And really, um, I didn't understand the importance of rest. And when people would say, you know, rest, I thought, well, I can do this. I don't have to rest. I, I, I wanted to be Productive, And, you know, there are certain people that have a problem with resting because they feel like if I'm not being productive and I'm not doing something, then I'm being lazy. Okay? And I want to tell you that that thinking has got to change because resting doesn't mean that you're lazy. Now, why is it so important rest? Rest is an important part of a healthy lifestyle for all ages. I want to tell you that, you know, there's a saying out there that the older you get, the less sleep you need. Do you know that that's a lie? That is not the truth. That is not the truth, that the older you get, the less sleep that you need. Even if you're doing it, that's not the truth, okay? Um... Rest rejuvenates your body, your mind, it regulates your mood, and is linked to learning and memory function. On the other hand, not getting enough rest can negatively affect your, your mood, your immune system, your memory, and your stress level. My cousin sent something on Facebook the other day, and I loved it. And she said, she's, she's my age, maybe like six months older. I'm six months older than her. And she said, I, I reached the wonder years. I wonder where I put my car. I wonder where I put my keys. I wonder where I put my pocketbook. And I said, you know, a- amen to that. I'm, I'm right there. Um, so I thought that was funny. Uh, sleep plays a vital role in good health and well-being throughout your life. Getting enough quality sleep at the right times can help protect mental health, physical health, quality of life, and safety. The way you feel while you're awake depends in part on what happens while you're sleeping. During sleep, your body is working to support healthy brain function and maintain your physical health. In, in support, healthy brain function and main, um, I'm sorry, in, in children, teens, sleep also helps and supports the growth and development. The damage from sleep deficiency can occur in an instant such as a car crash or it can harm you over time. For example, ongoing sleep deficiency can raise your risk for some chronic health problems. It also can affect how well you think, react, work, learn, and get along with others. Sleep helps your brain work properly. While you're sleeping, your brain is preparing for the next day. It is forming new pathways to help you learn and remember information. So think about it. When you're staying up all night, your brain is not preparing for the next day. Studies show that a good night's sleep improves learning. Whether you're learning math, how to play the piano, or or learning a a new hobby, or to drive a car, sleep helps enhance your learning problem-solving skills. Sleep also helps you pay attention and makes decisions, and sleep will also help you to be creative. I didn't know a lot of these things. Studies also show that sleep deficiency alters activities in some part of the brain. If you're sleep deficient, you may have trouble making decisions, solving problems, controlling your emotions and behavior, and coping with change. Sleep deficiency also has to be linked to depression, suicide, and risk-taking behavior. 
Uh, children and teens who are sleep deficient may have problems getting along with others. They may feel angry and impulsive with mood swings, feel sad. Does anybody ever experience any of this? So if you're not sleeping, that might be why you're doing that. Um, they also might have problems paying attention. They might get lower grades and feel stressed. Sleep plays an important role in your physical health. For example, sleep is involved in healing and the repair of your heart and your blood vessels. Ongoing sleep deficiency is linked to an increased risk of heart disease, kidney disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, and stroke. Sleep deficiency also increases the risk of obesity. Never knew that. For example, one study of teenagers showed that with each hour of sleep loss, the odds of them becoming obese went up. Sleep deficiency increases the risk of obesity in other ages, age groups as well. So when we don't get that sleep, when we don't get that rest, God designed those eight hours of sleep or whatever you're, you're supposed to sleep to be able to rest and rejuvenate. It's like a car. You can't have a car and never change the oil. You can't have a car and never fill up the gas tank. If you don't rest, it is going to affect every area of your life. When you think about it, even God rested on the seventh day. He worked for six. He said, this is good. Now I'm going to take time and I'm going to rest and I'm going to enjoy the things that I created. So many times we work and we work and we move and we go and we never get to enjoy our friends, our families, or the things that we work on having. You work so hard to have a house, but you're never home to enjoy the house. Amen? Okay, people are quiet. It's okay. So I talked about... He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Um, many times throughout the Bible, the Lord refers to us as sheep. And he is the great shepherd. But the strange thing about sheep is that because of their very makeup, it's almost impossible for them to be made to lie down unless there are four requirements. One is due to their timidity, they refuse to lie down unless they are free from all fear. If there is any fear inside about anything, a sheep will not lay down. Because of social behavior within the flock, sheep will not lie down unless they are free from friction with others of their kind. Wait till I start putting it in human terms. <laughs> if tormented by flies or parasites, sheep will not lie down. Only when free of these pests can they relax. And lastly, sheep will not lie down as long as they feel in need of finding food. They must be free from hunger. It's significant to be at rest because there must be a definite sense of freedom from fear, tension, aggravations, and hunger. The unique aspect of the picture is that only the sheep, the, sh the shepherd himself, who provides all of these things, can release them from their anxiety. It all depends upon the diligence of the owner whether or not his flock is free of disturbing influences. So when we talk about these four things, we see that sheep are affected very severely when there's fear, when certain things are not lined up, they cannot rest, and they can, so if they cannot rest, then they cannot function. Um, a flock that is restless, discontented, and always agitated and disturbed never does well, and it's the same thing when it comes to people. So let's, let's switch this now into human terms and people. When we look at this, it becomes very obvious that we are no different than sheep. The sheep can't rest if there is fear. 
Now, how many times have you laid down and your mind just begins to race because of all the things that you are concerned about? You go, day, you go throughout your day, you work and you're busy and you're exhausted and then you lay down at night and your mind is, is just racing. It's going over. There is no peace. Worry is the birth child of fear. Fear only exists when there is a lack of trust. That puts it very simply. If I've got fear in my life over something, it's because I am not fully trusting in God. And if I'm fearing something and my mind is racing, I don't have that peace. If I don't have that peace, I'm not finding that rest. When I don't have that rest, my, my emotions are wearing thin. I mean, have you ever had a good night's sleep? You're, you're fighting something, but you go home, you get a good night's sleep, and then you get up in the morning, and then everything looks differently? Okay. That's because your body has rest, and you live to fight another day. But when you're filled with that kind of anxiety, and you're filled with that fear, and listen, most of the things that we worry about don't even come to pass. All the stuff, and you, you, know, you know how you do it. You play every scenario. You play the what if game. Well, if this happens, I'll do this. If they say that, then I'll say that. If they do this, if they do that. And you have every single scenario played out so that, because nobody wants to be blindsided. But God is saying, listen, stand still. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Don't you think that I've got this already in my hand? I've got this all under control. You might be, and I might be caught off guard by something that happens. And listen, there are many things that happen in your life that you get blindsided. You get blindsided. Where did this come from? I didn't expect this. I was doing everything right. I was sowing the right seeds. I was going to church. I, I know that I put all the information. I know I dotted every I and I crossed every T. And all of a sudden, all hell broke loose in my life. So now you have that urgency. I have to fix this thing. I have to make it worse. I have to make it better. And fear... This is, something, this is something to really, really understand about fear. Fear has a voice. Fear has a voice. Listen, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Fear does not have arms and legs, but fear has a voice. The Bible tells us that the tongue is the smallest part of the body, but it can do the most damage. Satan can't touch you. But he can speak and he can say things. So when fear has a voice, the voice tells you the lie. And, and the fear always will speak louder. You know, it's, it's, it's very much sometimes when I, when I counsel people, and listen, by nature I'm Italian. So when Italians talk, if, if we talk in a lot, like we, we, we match each other's tone and then we take it to the next one. So if I'm talking to somebody and they're talking to me and they're, and they're, they're talking about their problem and I can't seem to get a word in edgewise, what will I do instinctively? I will go louder. And when I go louder, then they're thinking you're not hearing me and their voice will go louder. And it will just, it will escalate to the point, you know, you're supposed to be the pastor. Why are you yelling at me? And I'll say, I'm not yelling at you. I'm just trying to get through to your head because you're not listening because the fear, your fear and your experience is screaming at me and I'm trying to talk louder. But the thing is, God doesn't do that. God doesn't do that. God does not raise his voice. God does not argue with us. And what God will do is he will step back. And he will allow you to scream and yell and exhaust yourself 
until finally you come to the end of yourself so that you can start to listen to him. Okay. So fear has a voice and it's telling you, it lies to you, it's telling you, you're on your own. If you don't fix this, if you don't do this, if you don't take care of yourself, you're never going to get out of it. And listen, I think, I think they say that it takes about seven times for somebody to hear something before it finally gets in and you understand it. Sometimes I always felt bad if I, if I preached the same thing and somebody said to me, don't worry about it because it takes seven times for them to hear it before they finally understand it. So if you sound like a broken record, it's, it's not a bad thing because I'm always trying to say something differently, but sometimes you got to say things over and over and over again. So if, if you listen to something seven times, if you listen to that lie seven times, it tells you you've got to figure this out on your own. You start to believe it as the truth. So that's why you've got to be careful and be able to understand that when fear comes at you, when anxiety comes at you, because a lot of times you're so busy listening to the lie that your lie has become the truth. So you can't, you can't depend on what you are hearing, but you have to depend on what you feel. And when you feel that there is unrest, when you feel that anxiety, that's an indication that that is not God. Because God's name is Jehovah Shalom. He is a God of peace. This is his nature. This is who he is. So the next thing, sheep can't rest if there is friction with other sheep. Do you know that sheep are some of the most jealous animals? They are some of the most jealous, hateful animals. And I hate to say it, but so are Christians. Sometimes, you know, Christians, they're the last people that can celebrate somebody when they're getting blessed, especially if they're getting blessed with something you've been praying for. I want a man, I want a man, I want a man. Everybody gets engaged. You won't even show up to the wedding because you can't stand it. But then you get angry when you get married and nobody wants to show up. That's all I'm gonna say about that. Don't hate, celebrate. Don't hate, celebrate because when you see somebody else getting blessed, if you're trusting God, the way you'll see it is you'll say, my God is El Shaddai. He's the God of more than enough. If, if, if he did it for Lisa and, and he's doing it for her, guess what? I might be right next in line for it to happen. So if I can rejoice with you and pray for you and get excited for you as though it's happening for me, God will turn around and do it for me, and he will do it for you. Now, here's the thing about the friction with other sheep. This whole Bible study, and it's funny that this teaching lands on this night, because this whole Tuesday night was birthed out of a teaching about the spirit of offense. It was supposed to last four, year, four weeks, and it's lasted 11 years. Because the enemy... He loves, he loves to cause strife within the body of Christ. Now listen, have you ever had a confrontation? Have you ever had somebody do you wrong or lie about you and, and you go through this thing and you, you lay down at night and you replay the conversation? You go over on Facebook and you read it over and over and over again and you become a Facebook stalker because you want to go on the other person's wall and see what they're saying and see what they're posting and you're trying to put two and don't sit there and pretend that you don't do it. The devil is a liar. But we begin, there begins to get that friction 
And Satan wants that friction in the body of Christ because as long as there is an irritation and there is a friction, there is no peace. And the anointing, how, how pleasant it is when brethren dwell in unity. When they dwell in unity, it makes the oil begin to flow. Now, when you read the next verse, when it says, you know, he, he, he anointeth my head with oil. The reason that he anoints the, the, the shepherd anoints the sheep's head. He anoints his thinking with oil because when the, when, the, when the flies and the gnats go at the sheep, they bang their head up against the rock. And they end up getting brain damage. It's the truth. So when there's friction, there's no peace. When you don't know, when you allow your enemy... To have so much say over your life. When you don't know how to take your enemy and place them in Jesus' hands. Listen, you become against me. You're not coming against me. You're coming against God. Because if I understand that I am God's child and he is my father. Listen, my children know, and I'm a human being. They know if anybody messes with my children. I had, I had somebody call in my house, and they were pranking my house the other night. And I, oh, I was mad. And I, and I, and I got the kid's name, and, and, I, and I, was, I was ready to go. And, and both my kids, Sammy said, Mom, please, please, for the love of God, I've got to go to school with this kid. Please, leave it alone. Do not confront it. Do not fight it. Because I have to go to school and bear the brunt of it. Because she knows the shepherd is going to take care of the sheep. But when you start to take that stuff and you, t- you start to get agitated, you start to get upset, you start to, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and your mind never rests. And when your mind never rests, it's impossible for you to say, Lord, this is my enemy. If they're coming against me, they're not coming against me. They're coming against you. That's why God says, listen, Satan, you want to mess? You want to mess with my kids? Go ahead. Because if you mess with my kids, you're really messing with me. And I'll, and I'll shut the lion's mouth again. I'll open the prison door. I'll do whatever I got to do. But if you're fighting them, you're not fighting them. You're fighting me. And you're fighting a losing battle. So when we can rest and we can trust in God and know that when people come against us, listen, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. So when somebody's coming at you, you're coming at a child of God, begin to pray for them and ask God to have mercy on them, but God will deal with them and God will set you free. Amen? Okay. So sheep are very jealous animals. When they, when they see another sheep who has a nice green patch, all to themselves, they get angry. And all of that stuff You've got to be able to know that God is my father. And God, what he gives, he's got enough to go around for everybody. Amen? Okay. Sheep can't rest when they are tormented by flies and gnats. Now, when you think about it, how annoying is it when you're, when you're somewhere and you're, you're picnicking outside and there's flies or there's the gnats when you're going down to the beach. And you think about it. You get upset. And sometimes people will actually stay home and not go to the beach because of the gnats. But when you think of it in perspective, look at how big you are. And how small the gnat is. And we become intimidated by it. And it, and it is annoying. And that's why sometimes... Bigger tragedies like death and sickness, sometimes it is so much easier to give those things to God because it's so far out of our control. It is so far out of our control that we can't do anything about it. But when, when it's the small foxes that spoil the vine, that's what you spend. If you really look, if you really, really look at your life, you will probably spend 95% of your time fighting the small foxes and 5% 
the big tragedies. I had one father, one brother, that was two tragedies. But every day there are gnats and there are flies. And it is the gnats and the flies that exhaust you. It's when everything is coming at you. And when Jesus said, listen, I don't want you to worry about a thing. All the little financial things, the bills that come in, the problems at work, the this, the that. How am I going to figure this out? How am I going to do that? And it's all of that little stuff. It's like, it's like the gnats. And like I said before, the shepherd has to anoint the head of the sheep with oil because the sheep... To get the gnats and the flies away, they bang their heads up against a rock and cause brain damage. How much brain damage have we had? Because we've been banging our heads up against the wall trying to deal with the flies and the gnats. Think about it. How many stupid and foolish and needless arguments have you had with people and even dealing with problems that you worried so much, and then as quick as that problem came in, all of a sudden God just went, that's it, and it's over. But you end up getting brain damage because you're trying to fix it, and you're banging your head up against a rock, you're banging your head up against the wall, trying to make sense out of something that God is saying, can you just give it to me? Just give it to me. See, sometimes I think because we're so raised in the sense that, you know, we're supposed to be independent, we're supposed to be, you know, self-sufficient. And listen, in life there's a balance of that. But Jesus said, listen, I want every area of your life. I care about every single area. There is nothing too big or too small that, that I care about or that I don't care about in your life. I care about everything. Okay. Sheep cannot rest when they are hungry. Now, if you're a night eater like me, you really identify with that. Okay? I mean, sometimes when you can't sleep, when, you, when you're sitting in bed and your mind is racing, what's the first thing? Those leftover chicken cutlets. They are calling you or whatever it is. When I was losing weight, the biggest habit that I had to break was not eating at night and I was laughing because if you how many have seen the new um Weight Watcher commercial with Oprah and she says I found out she said I love bread <laughs> and I'm thinking this is probably the richest woman definitely probably in America but even probably in the world right she has all the money in the world, and she is obsessed with bread. That this is the thing that she lives for. And here's the thing about Weight Watchers, and if you've ever done Weight Watchers, you understand that the whole premise of Weight Watchers is that you can eat everything. You can eat all the fruits of the trees. You just have to do it in moderation. And I thought about it when she, I, I mean, it, it made me laugh because everybody's got that trigger food. So it was something that I could relate to when she said it. But when she said it, she said it with such, such passion. Like you, you saw, you saw the, you saw the inner issues coming out, you know. And and I thought, you know, right away I got this picture of like, God sets a feast before us. It's like better than than the the buffets that we'll get in Lancaster, okay. He sets, he, you, you, you've got meats and you've got fruits and vegetables and fish and you've got all candy and you've got everything. And over here, there's just a piece of bread. And you are so fixated on a piece of bread because that's what you like, that's what you want, that you don't see the rest of the stuff that God has laid out for you that says, listen, look at everything else that I have given to you. Look at all the other things that I have done. Look at what I have made and I've created for you and you are fixating on a piece of bread. On one thing. Look at how many times I brought you through this battle. I brought you through this sickness. I paid this bill. 
I protected you from that enemy. And now this little, this thing comes in your life and you don't think that I'm big enough to handle this? And we get, we get fixated. And the reason that we get hungry is sometimes we don't really understand what we're hungry for. And that hunger there is, is hunger for the presence of God. And here's the thing about God. So many people will cry out, God, I want you. I want your presence. I want you to come in and I, and I want you to be part of my life. And God says, okay. But when he starts to do it, we have to understand, like, like John the Baptist, he said, I have to decrease so that he can increase. So when we cry out those, those prayers to God, they're the right prayers, and they're according to God's will, and those are the prayers that God quickly answers. We've just got a problem with how he starts to answer them because he slowly, he takes he starts to mess with things. He starts to take, you know, take things out and remove things. So that's exactly, you know, what we do in the spirit of God. God has set this feast and we fixate on a problem. We fixate on this thing because we've, we're trying to fix it. And as long as it's in our hands and we're doing it, we can't rest. We never find rest. We never find that peace. So why, why is rest such a difficult concept? And I really do believe because the definition of rest, it means to cease work or movement in order to relax, to refresh, or to recover your strength. Does anybody here really know how to cease from work, from movement, from thinking? I mean, really, when you think about it, I mean, how hard is it when you've got a situation going on not to think and stress about that thing that's going on. Because the, the idea of stand still, stand still, I mean, you, you don't mean stand still, you mean stand still, but I'm still doing something, right? No, 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 no. Stand still and watch, and, and watch me, watch me, figure this thing out for you. Now, rest and brokenness, they go hand in hand. I was talking to somebody and they said, I'm just so broken. I'm so broken hard. I'm, I'm already broke. How much more is God going to break me? And I had to say to them, listen, you can be broken hearted and in despair but not broken and a lot of people confuse despair and being upset about something and thinking that it's brokenness because I can be in despair and I can be upset about something and still thinking on it, and still meditating on it, and still trying to fix it, and still trying to find a way to manipulate it, or do this, or do that, to make the outcome. Brokenness is when you come to that place where you really come to the end of yourself. You come to the end of yourself, and you fully know that you can't handle it, that you can't do it, that you have done everything you know how to do. You have thought, you have thought it through every, every step of the way and, and you can't, it's become such a burden to you and so heavy to you that you no longer 
can carry it. And it's that place when you finally say to God, I can't do this, and I won't do it. So I'm leaving it in your hands, and I'm not even going to think about it anymore. I'm not even going to talk about it anymore. Sometimes we keep those problems alive because we've got to talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. And we will talk about it because we have a need to be heard. And, and it's to a point where I've heard you and I've seen you. Now give it a rest so you can rest. And until you get to the place where God, you know what? I can't even pray about this anymore. I don't know if anybody's ever been to that place where God, I can't, I can't even, I can't even bring this up anymore. I can't even talk to you about it anymore. I literally have to take it and put it in your hands and say, whatever. Whatever. I can't do it. And sometimes you could be going through something that has touched a place in your heart that is so difficult to deal with. That sometimes you literally got to lock yourself in your room so that you don't put your hands on it. So that, so that you don't say it. Sometimes it might be with your credit cards. Listen, you might be in so much financial debt. The only way you can do to stop spending money, and all, cut your credit cards up. Don't go into a store. Don't, don't do anything defeated. Sometimes people with their children. I got to get my hands off of this thing. So I'm not going to look at you. I'm not going to say nothing to you. I'm going to shut my mouth. And God, they belong to you. They belong to you. You're praying for an unsaved person. And let me tell you something. When you love somebody and you're praying for an unsaved person, you're praying for a loved one or anything like that, these, you love them so much, you want to fix it. And if that burden gets so much that everything that you are doing, it's not working, God's saying, I need you to take your hands off of it. And you're not broken until you've come to the end of yourself. Because despair and brokenness are two completely different things. Because you can be broken hearted over something and in despair over something, but still putting all your hands on it, which means you're trying to control it. Does that make sense? Okay. So Bible says, David said, he maketh me to lie down. You know, you remember if you've had children, you remember when it came to nap time Charlie and Kimberly were impossible. They never slept. Now they'll sleep till 4 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> but when they were babies, they were horrendous sleepers. They never slept when they were supposed to. And when I would try so hard to get them to lie down, I would, I would literally like put them down on the, and like just kind of like lay on them. You know, like, go to bed, go to bed. <laughs> Go to sleep. It was so frustrating. I mean, because, and, and, they were, and they were running, and they never exhausted themselves. Samantha was a type of child where she would just get up and she would leave. I said, where are you going? I'm tired. I'm going to bed. She would put herself, she was just the perfect child. She's the golden child. But the other two drove me nuts. I had insomnia for like six years. I never slept. Bobby never slept. I mean, we walked around like it, we were exhausted all the time. Bobby used to walk around the house with, with his eyes closed, and he had the baby in, in his in the, the, her feet, and he used to shake her and just walk around, and he would sleep standing up while he was shaking the baby, trying to put, because my kids would not go to sleep. They wouldn't go to sleep, and they wouldn't stay in the car seat in the car. It was unbelievable. They were like Houdini. They could break out of any contraption that I put them in. It was horrendous. It was real. It was, I'm still traumatized over it. You could tell. So David said, he maketh me to, to lie down in green pastures. The Israelites who read this psalm when David wrote it a thousand years before Christ, 
would have known from experience how hard it is to get sheep to lie down. Sheep are absolutely defensiveless. If a wolf or a lion comes in, they can't do anything but run. And even if they do run, they can't run fast. Their bodies are basically like watermelons with four toothpicks sticking out on the bottom. So all they do is they model. They, they waddle, so, so they're vulnerable. They can't, they, they wanna run, they see it coming, they can't get away from it. They wanna get as much as a head start as possible when danger comes. So if a sheep is going to lie down, the sheep has to feel absolutely and totally secure. Think about that. They cannot rest because if there is even a threat of fear, they know their limitations. They know that they're waddlers. They know that they can't get away fast enough. So they're always trying to move. Isn't that just like us? There are some things that we try to run from, but we can't run fast enough. And this really goes back to Adam and Eve. When they messed up and they fell, they tried to cover themselves. They tried to do it for themselves. And God the Father said, you can't do this. You can't take care of yourself. You can't cover. You can't fix. You can't do it. You have to do it through me. I'm the one who covers you because I'm your father. You never knew what anxiety and fear and depression was until you walked away. Now this is part of the curse. This is, this is where works mentality came in. Because we try to cover ourselves. But Jesus is our shepherd. Now, um, when, 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 that's why when you see sheep, sheep are always standing for the most part. You never really go by sheep and, and watch them and seeing them lie down. Um, sheep also need their stomachs filled or else they're constantly on the move looking to be fed. It's why when we don't spiritually gear up, when we're not in the word every day, and we're not filling ourselves, we get hungry. And because sheep are not the brightest of animals, they don't know what's best for them. They're going on instinct. I'm hungry, so I'm gonna keep moving. There's fear, so I'm gonna keep moving. And they never rest, so the shepherd knows if I don't get these sheep to lie down, they're gonna hurt themselves. They're gonna be even in more danger. And God knows that about us. So I wanna make it very clear that God doesn't afflict us. He does not send sickness upon us, okay? There is a school of thought out there that will teach that. And I will tell you, that that's wrong. God is a God of mercy and a God of love. But whom God loves, he chastens. And because God is a father, God will allow certain things to come into our life to force us to lay down. I was somebody, because I was raised in ministry Serving, serving, so it was, it was, it was who, uh, who my husband and I were. Nonstop, whatever, and I mean, anything, and if I wasn't gifted in it, I would make myself gifted in it. Wherever there was a need, I would fill it. And, and there is a blessing in that because God wants people to serve. But if you're not doing it, because God, God says, listen, I need you to do this. You're busy. It's like Martha and Mary. 
He was not rebuking Martha because she was busy about so many things. Jesus wasn't denying the importance of work. And he was not saying to Martha, you're wrong for wanting to feed us and wanting to clean and wanting to take care of all this stuff. But he said, at this very moment, Mary has chosen the better thing. Why? Because she is resting. And it's just like, you know, um, the cars nowadays, they have that little light on them that says, maintenance required. And it's a pain in the neck because you might not be ready to bring that car in, but that car is reminding you, I need a rest. I need somebody to look at me. I need my oil changed. Forget about you trying to squeeze another thousand miles. I got to have it. I got to have it changed, and I got to have it changed now. Otherwise, you can't see certain things on your screen that you're used to seeing. So it forces you to rest. Your car is making you make it lie down so that it can get rejuvenated and, and replenished. So sometimes, like me, three C-sections, two years apart, had them on Monday, in church on Friday, and I never, ever stopped. When they told me not to sweep, I didn't, I, I didn't listen because I thought... If I can do it, I should do it. And then here I was, 10 years later, I'm 36 years old. And because my body never rested, there was so much scar tissue, there were so many problems. At 36 years old, I had to have a hysterectomy. And then I was laid out for eight weeks that I couldn't. I couldn't go to church. Did God do that to me and punish me? Absolutely not. But God has a way. See, Satan will send things to destroy you, but God has a way of saying, I'll make good out of this. Because my daughter, she needs a rest. So now I'm going to force her to lay down because my daughter is not smart enough to know what's good for her. I'll admit it. I'm not stupid in compared to people, but in, 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 in comparison to God, yeah, I'm stupid. Because I don't know what's best for me. Sheep are stupid animals. And God's not calling us stupid. I'm not stupid in, in, in comparison to man, but according to God, because listen, his ways are not my ways. His ways are so much higher than mine. He is so much smarter than I am. He knows what's good for me. I think I know what's good for me. I think I know what I want. And God says, if I allow you to keep going at this pace, if I keep allowing you See, we get angry when God brings up our issues to us and he starts showing us those inner parts or he allows certain things to happen. We start to get angry and we start to think, God, you've abandoned me and you've left me and I'm here to fight. And God's saying, I have not left you. I have not abandoned you, but I have brought you to this very place because I need you to be still. And if being still means you got to be laid up a little bit and inconvenienced, then I've got to do that. I've got to allow that to happen because what you don't understand is your body and your mind needs rest. Amen. That I don't do things to hurt you, but I will use the trials and tribulations of life to bring you to a place that will make you understand you need me. Because sometimes we don't realize the mistakes that we make until we can't go any further. Have you ever experienced something like that? But you, your, your first thought is that the lie starts going off in your head. God's doing this to you. God is forcing you. God, God, God's angry with you. And this is all happening because God is angry. And listen, God did not do it. He didn't do this to you, but he's allowed it because he knows something. He knows that if you and I, we keep going at that pace, 
if we don't learn how to trust things to him and become those broken vessels, then we become vessels that he's got to shelve and he can't use. We become backed up. And listen, God's got a plan and a purpose for your life and my life. And he can't get us to that place where he can allow us to use us the way he really intends us until we are ready for it. God is a loving father and he knows what is best for his child. And listen, when you've been raised under a, a performance-oriented father, or, or a very uh, domineering father, as we learn. Sometimes people are very forceful and they're angry and they're authoritative like that. It's because they're trying to make themselves feel good about themselves. And that's why they'll try to control every part of your life and, and be mean and be angry. But God says, listen, I know who I am. And I'm not doing this because I'm angry. When, when I tell you to do something... Or when I allow certain things to come in your life, I'm doing it so you feel better. Sometimes God will allow certain things to come in your life because he's saying, listen, you're in this depression. You're in this funk because you are trying to fix this. And if you Put your hands on this anymore. You're going to destroy it. It's going to blow up. So God, in his mercy and in his love, and sometimes it doesn't feel like that. And listen, I've had to do this, and I've had to do it recently. Just, I'm done. Can I tell you? Within three days, three days, all of a sudden, I saw God start to change a situation. Now listen, cruise ships are big ships, and they take a long time to turn and change course. And just because progress is slow, it is still progress. But when you can truly take something, whatever it is that you're going through, whatever that is that your mind just cannot get off of it, you think about it constantly. For some, it's finances. For some, it's children. For some, it's health. Sometimes you go through, through, through situations, and it's all of the above. But I learned the quicker I get it off of me and I get it onto him, the quicker God will move. That's why I want you to write this down, and I want you to meditate on this. When I act, when I act or react, God rests. But when I rest, God begins to act. God will not move until you and I get out of the way. He will not move until you and I get out of the way. When I act or react, God will rest. But when I rest, God begins to act. And let me tell you something. When God needs your attention, when he sees, when he sees that you're doing something that is detrimental, okay, listen, it's like, like you and I, when, when you see your children or you see somebody that you love and they have the wrong influences around them, 
What's the first thing you tell your kids? Stop hanging with those kids. They're bad influences. When, when you're hanging out with somebody and, and you can see yourself changing, when you hang out with a depressive, negative, agitated person, and all of a sudden you find yourself depressed and agitated and negative, and you can't seem to get away and pull yourself away, because sometimes you think you're ministering or you're going to help them and you're going to change them, but they end up changing you. What God does because he loves you, he starts pulling those people out. He starts pulling and removing those people out. And you think at first that there's something wrong with you. And you start because you've been rejected and abandoned and all that, and you don't realize because you don't realize that you're God's child and you don't, you don't see it in that perspective that, oh, dad, these are not, this is not good. Oh, you took them out? Oh, okay. Explain. Wow, that, <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know, maybe this is a cup of coffee that you and I are gonna have, but what that means is no, God, no, it's not talking about physically killing them. Although sometimes you'd like that, but no, God is not a hitman, okay? God's not a hitman. But have you ever had um, a relationship, like a best friend or, or somebody that you were close with, and somehow they just turned their back on you and they left you for no reason, or you had a stupid blow up? or something just, circumstance just didn't work out. And all of a sudden, those people, they up and they left you. They rejected you, okay? So you thought you did something to offend them. You put it on yourself that you were wrong. What you don't realize is that God says, Kim, I love you, and, and, and these people are no good for you, so I know you don't have the strength and the know-how to get rid of these people and tell them, leave and get out of my life, but because I love you enough, I'm going to remove them. Now you, the enemy tries to lie to you and makes you think that you're not good enough or that you did something wrong. But in time, you understand that man's rejection is God's protection. Okay? So that's, that, that's a good question. That's what that means. So God will begin to remove the distractions. God will remove the different things that are pulling you out of his orbit. And when you begin to start to really, really digest and get that rhema that God is your father, what happens is your faith gets expanded and your faith acts like gravity. And because your faith is like gravity, you can begin to pull things that are in, that are in heaven down to earth. And that's what happens. That's why we're, we're heading towards learning about what is the kingdom of God? What is it to walk in God's with? Because listen, the kingdom of God is what we're supposed to be walking in. But until we can understand that there is a kingdom and there is a king, and the king is your biological father, and you are filled with his blood, and your name, okay, is the same as his name, you're not going to walk in kingdom principles until you start to understand this. This is why we began with the orphan spirit. Because if you don't understand that God is your father, forget about who you were born to, Amen. you won't understand God is your father. Don't look at God your father like you did your earthly father, whether he was good or he was bad. Because God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. God is perfect. God is love. Love, perfect love, it cast out all fear. So when you're a child of God and you understand who God is and you understand who you are in God, you understand that God is love and that's why you have, you don't have fear. You're not living under that fear. Why? Because God is perfect and his love cast out all fear. And when you understand that God is your father, he feeds you and he will make you lie down. It's difficult to have to be forced to lie down. But if you don't lie down and you don't get rest, 
you can't get rejuvenated. You can't get refreshed. You can't think right. Your relationships don't work. You ever not sleep for days? Or go two, three hours? You're nuts. You've got no patience. You can't deal with people. And if you think about it, if you would have just gone back home and gone to sleep, what bothered you on Monday won't bother you on Tuesday. Because God will refresh you. Amen? Amen. Amen.